Welcome to tonight's talk. It's Edge AI based flare monitoring to reduce global warming. The uh, speakers are Greg Murkowski, head of data science solutions, myself, and Himanshu Goyal, a data scientist in my group of Johnson Controls Incorporated. Uh, today is Wednesday, June 27th. A background slide on San Francisco Bay Area ACM. Uh, we were founded in 1957, so we're 65 years old. Uh, founded to promote the knowledge of modern computing. Uh, we want to create community, support networking and hiring. There's a $20 annual membership. We have upcoming talks on our Meetup channel and our past talks on our YouTube channel. Um, we may have two monthly meetings, a general computing meeting and a data science SIG or special interest group. Uh, some upcoming ACM webinar events. And the next one is some science fair student talks on Wednesday, July 20th. And there's two talks that evening, enabling advanced queries on unstructured databases with provable accuracy guarantee and superior efficiency. And then a uh, second talk that night is novel machine learning based smart navigation attachment to aid glaucoma patients. Then in July, we have uh, AI talk that's scaling ML AI workloads with the Ray ecosystem. Uh, and then later in August, we have limitations of AI systems on explainability, causality, and ethics. You can use the chat in Zoom if you have questions for the speakers. Um, or also if you have technical issues, if you have a data science related job opening um, or computer science related job opening, you could post a link there, make yourself available. Other people can network with you on the chat. So to introduce tonight's talk. Um, so the subject is, this is a system for real time monitoring of natural gas flow rate at the edge. Um, and so uh, they, you need to measure something in order to manipulate it. And we wanna measure the emissions and the gas flaring uh, with an objective of trying to reduce global warming. Uh, we investigated the efficient debt and mask RCNN deep neural net models architectures to find the fire and smoke and to get the area in units. So not just in pixels, but in square meters. Uh, integrated with other sensor inputs, um, along with the square meters of fire, square meters of smoke and plus sensor inputs into a physics model to estimate the gas flow rate. And we got it to within plus or minus 10% accuracy. Uh, the client had requested at the beginning of the project to be within plus or minus 30% accuracy. So we did a good job at that. The models also go through an edification effort. That's a, a way to optimize the models to shrink them, uh, speed them up. So we were able to get a three X uh, speed up and also to reduce the size. For background on the two speakers, my picture's on the left. I've been deploying data mining models since 92 at seven different startups, and I've been through four acquisitions. The most recent acquisition was when Johnson Controls acquired Falkhorn Systems at the beginning of the year. Hamanshu, my co-presenter, has been with uh, Falkhorn and JCI for about two years. Before that, he was a uh, founder at uh, two packs on uh, face recognition projects. For that, he was an analyst at City or Citibank for about two years. So now I'll switch over and uh, we'll start the presentation for the evening. So I'll give a first half and then Amanchu will give a second half. So we're talking about the Flare Advance. This is an enterprise uh, product. So the problem we're solving is that uh, gas flaring is a process of burning natural gas associated with oil and gas extraction. Uh, so there could be thousands of gas flares and they burned about 142 billion cubic meters of gas in 2020. Uh, so one cubic meter is gonna be about 2.5 kilograms of CO2 emissions. So the result is about 400 million tons of CO2. So this is what we wanna try and move the needle on is reducing this CO2. So uh, a natural question somebody in the audience might ask is, well, why burn this at all? Well, the organic compounds, uh, ethane, methane, butane, propane, are 25 times worse for global warming than the CO2. So that's the answer to why do the burning, because they're trying to convert it to something that's less bad for the environment. So as a broad theme, you know, need to measure something before you can manipulate and reduce it. So at a natural gas processing plant, during the removal of the sulfur from the natural gas, that's a process called sweetening um, because the sulfur is so stinky. 
uh, when there's problems occur. So think of this as an analogy to uh, automotive assembly line, you know, where you have different stages, um, you know, you put a wheel on, then you put on a hubcat in a manufacturing line. Well, this is all uh, chemical engineering. And so if something happens in the chemical engineering process, then some of the organic compounds are released. So this is a symptom of a problem. Kind of like if your car is burning black smoke, that's a symptom that you're burning oil. Your engine needs to be tuned up or to make some adjustments. So the sooner you can detect the problem, the sooner it can be addressed and the flaring can be stopped. Um, so uh, these are the, the first four, um, methane, ethane, propane, and butane. And you can see in the 3D structure, it's just chains of carbons and hydrogens. And the chains just get longer and longer. Now I bring this up because uh, most of the mass is gonna be in the carbon, not the hydrogen. And so we go from one carbon atom to four carbon atoms. Um, and so that'll come into play with some of the physics properties. So if we have some gas shooting out of a stack, then, um, and we have a wind blowing by, so we're, we're gonna be measuring the angle of the flare. Um, and the angle of the flare coming out will be a function of the mass of the gas, like how, what's, is it mostly methane or is it mostly butane or some other mix? Times the speed of the gas. So just like momentum, mass times speed. So um, if you have a heavier mass at the same speed or lighter mass at the same speed, that'll resist the wind more. So that'll become part of the physics equation. So just as a diagram, so uh, we have this uh, gas plant um, and then it'll come through now in our, uh, our client had a expensive gas flow meter that provides the target for the model training. That wasn't there in most of the rollouts. Um, so this flow meter might be $100,000. So what this project is trying to do is come up with an estimate to replace this flow meter in the bottom center. Um, by just using cameras and an edge computer. Um, but this gave us enough to build the training data with the target for the initial uh, model. And so the gas would continue flow and it would go up to the stack and then come out of the stack. So we don't use the term fire uh, because in the oil and gas industry, that's con considered an uncontrolled event. Flaring is a controlled process. They have a pilot light, light just like the gas heater uh, for your water at home would have a pilot light. So this flaring is a controlled process. Now, so the diagram of the solution is we want to take a look at this um, uh, image and then convert it to, uh, you know, we have the image coming from a camera that goes into our flare advanced solution here. There's a mass Garcia and neural net and then coming out of it then we'll come up with a, a, a detailed edge going around. And that's what Hamanchu is going to go into details on, is how do we find this detailed edge? And then we're just looking at the area of pixels inside. Now we have to be able to convert pixels to square meters. So when we first install a camera, we would have a measurement, like uh, drawing a line at the tip of the stack. Maybe that's uh, 2.3 meters across. So if we know at the distance of the camera, this is 2.3 meters, then we can interpret the, the number of pixels and convert that to square meter. So this mask RCNN isn't the end product. Usually the neural net is the final stage. Here, we're just coming up with the area of the flare and area of the smoke, and also the angle. Now we'll have other sensors coming in, a wind, a gas composition. Um, so that has to do with how many carbon atoms um, in there, what the mass is, um, a stack temperature, and a stack pressure. So that'll come into a physics-based model along with the, the angle. And then we'll come out with an estimate of the gas volume. And that's the final end product of this. And so then this is what the image looks like on the final screen. So we're getting, um, so we're getting this edge. That's for the area uh, from the stack tip to the center of mass. We're using that to come up with the angle. Um, and then also we're coming up with a sample color, the medium, the most common color. And that also has to do with the chemistry of burning. It was something that they found useful. This little diagram on the bottom right was an annotation. Uh, given the camera position, um, then you can see this little green arrow. If you're looking at uh, a worst case is if the wind is blowing the flame straight towards you, 
then you can't really tell what the angle is. Or, or if the wind is blowing the, uh, the flare straight away from you, it's harder to figure out the, the angle. But if it's blowing to the right or left of you, it's much easier. So these dark areas are indicating where it's harder to read the angle. So we, we see from this arrow that it's blowing to the right so we can have more confidence that we have a good read on the angle. Um, and so yeah, black smoke can indicate the presence of liquid drops, droplets in the gas stream. So the flare color helps them to understand the composition. Um, so the output um, it will have a real time what the flare length is in feet and the flow rate um, in particular units they care. And then we have uh, like a fire to smoke ratio, a flare angle in degrees, uh, smoke color as far as a percent. So these are some of the real time KPIs that the client found useful. Um, also, when we started this, we built it before we started engaging with the client. And so we could try and find some flaring images from uh, public domain, um, not images that would be sold or had copyrighted by the public domain. Uh, we also worked with a third party vendor, Paracosma, to generate synthetic images with labels. And so they would use video game engines like the Unreal Engine or the Unity in engine. That way we could control the time of day, wind, uh, confusion cases in the, in the sky, like clouds, because you could have gray smoke or you could have gray clouds. And we want to have confusion cases in there so the model can learn to distinguish and also vary the number of smokestacks. So here you can see we have four stacks um, where the horizon is a sky in the background, two stacks where there's jungle in the background and so on. This is an example where a camera is set poorly with its light exposure. And so it ends up being overexposed. And so we had to deal with some of those kind of corner case conditions. And then here's where the stacks are going, but they're not that bright against the jungle because there's some local lights in the area where they're illuminating the, the region with the pipes and the stacks. But there's a tall jungle behind and it's not just a sky. So by being able to control all these conditions, uh, we could control what we put into the training data. Um, and then when we got to the client site, then we also would let the client gather site images, label them, and then do a model refresh, kind of updating the, the existing um, analytic uh, system, the software system with uh, uh, the particular uh, images. So to compare some of the different model approaches, we had a mobile net V1, that would be something that'd be very small. A mobile net could be something that could run on a mobile phone, very low resolution. Um, to efficient debt D4 and D6, there's different levels of efficient debt D, D0 to D7 that increase the input resolution. But also, as you go higher input resolution, it takes more compute time for inferencing. And then we also tested the mask RCNN. So here, these had rectangles, but then we needed to go to a mask. The idea with efficient debt is trying to do post-processing to go from the bounding box rectangle to try and estimate a mask. But in a, um, as Hamancho will tell you, uh, better with a mask RCNN. So for the, the flare, precision was 99% and uh, smoke was 85%. Um, so uh, this is uh, some of our results. And then to kind of compare forecast versus actual. Um, so here we're showing a, a reference uh, flow rate versus an estimated flow rate um, on here. So this is over time in minutes. So uh, then some of the model description on the most important uh, variables. So the scaling factor was very important. That had to do with the, uh, the resolution. Um, so if you drop the resolution, that would have the biggest impact. So I'll finish. And then Hamanchu can present. Uh, yes, Greg. Okay, Greg. Quick yes. question. Sure. Uh, what does the Venturi effect got to do with this? Like, uh, if uh, the smokestack is kind of constricted because of uh, the whatever accumulation of uh, the gas and all those things, then you have a Venturi effect throwing the flame out too far than what it should be. Uh, let me restate your question. Can you have the, is there a wind shear problem that ever could happen? Where, well, I mean, we have a pilot light that's below the level of the stack. 
So before it comes out like a foot below. And so then the pilot light would be able to light the, the gas coming out. So it's not typically a problem where it would blow out. I mean, because they've been doing it for- No, no, it's not, it's not blowing out. It's a kind of, you, you're, uh, the, the, flume, uh, fl the plume length may be longer than what it should be, what it really is, right? If you have entry effects, you get the velocity is higher. If the stack has to uh, kind of an arrow at some point in between, then you'll have a higher velocity after that uh, after that uh, constriction. Well, we're, the, we're just. The, the, I mean, our training data had had the gas going through the same constriction as the inferencing data, so the model would be able to account for that because our our training data and, and scoring inference production data was all in the same environment. Then, you know, Mancha, if you'd like to start your camera, you may. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was the overview that we had for the project. So I will be covering the project from technical perspective, like what are the te some technical milestones that we achieved in this project, and uh, uh, what were the some of uh, the problem that we faced during the project. So there were two. Uh, uh, sort of problem that we were dealing with uh, with this project. Uh, the first problem that we are dealing with uh, is can we predict how much volume of the gas that uh, we are burning when we are uh, seeing the player. So there is a gas coming from down the stack and there is a player. So the size of the player that we have would be directly depending on uh, the amount of gas that's coming from the stack. So how does these two variables are correlated? That, that's the first motive. And the second motive is that can we tell about the quality of the player? Uh, like during the normal operation that the smoke that we are seeing here is not supposed to be there. So can we tell or alert the user about any abnormal operation uh, by visualizing that uh, uh, smoke is dark in color or the ratio of the smoke to the fire is of abnormal proportion or not what it is of usual. So that was the two objectives that we started with. And uh, yeah, this is the overall system that we have designed. There are three parts to the uh, system. The first part is uh, the ML model inferencing, where we take a video stream as an input. It goes through MRC and model, uh, and it outputs us uh, the detection of where the player is and where the smoke is. Based on these detections, we calculate some of the KPIs related to the project. Uh, the, uh, some of the KPIs are, <clears throat> Uh, very uh, uh, usual like player, what is the player land, how much is the area, how much is the player color, uh, what is the uh, smoke area and uh, some of the parameters that we calculate. These are very basic parameters that we calculate some uh, based on simple inferencing. We have a pixel to uh, feed uh, conversion ratio based on that we convert these parameters. Then the part two is basically the physics based model. So based on the calculated KPI, we have a physics model, which given the length of the fire and the, uh, some other parameter like wind speed and direction, the header pressure and temperature stack characteristic. Based on that, we uh, run this physics based model and calculate the gas flow rate, which is the final output. Now, one of the input to this parameter is the wind speed and direction. For that, we have to build a separate module, which is wind speed prediction. Uh, it takes two parameters uh, as an input, time of the day and the player angle. So I will be discussing about uh, uh, all three systems. In uh, just uh, comment briefly. Uh, normally we would have liked to have had a sensor that's a wind speed. Um, at this site, at this location, the client didn't want to have a wind speed sensor. So since we didn't have a wind speed sensor, we were looking around for what we could do and we found possibly as a corner case in the desert, wind speed was highly correlated with time of day and fairly consistent. So at sunrise and sunset, then the winds would pick up. And so then we could get a typical wind speed by, by time of day, and then uh, use a model to uh, come up with a prediction. So that ended up working out fairly well. If you were in Central America in a jungle area, that might not work out at all. Um, but that was something for this case. For the general application, we would be assuming to have a, a wind speed sensor. So go ahead and continue. Yeah. Uh, the first part is basically the mass segmentation model. 
So if you don't know in ML, we have computer vision. In computer vision, we have multiple kinds of problem. This one is particularly called mass segmentation problem. That given an image, can we exactly segregate uh, uh, object of interest? Like for in this example, uh, we are detecting where actually the player is, and the second where exactly the smoke is. By this, we can exactly map the area, and we can um, map the volume uh, also by a conversion factor. And we have this. Uh, yeah. So the first task we worked on this uh, training this model. Uh, which can tell us where the fire and smoke is in the image. Uh, now I will discuss. So this mass-based RCN, uh, there are multiple approaches that we have for mass RCN, and it's a very uh, evolving field of computer vision. But the one model that we used uh, was Facebook Detectron. The basically the crust of the model is it's used a fast RCN as a backbone. And uh, what advancement it has done is basically, other than a class box, which, which class the object belongs to, it also has a convolution left for uh, uh, that converts for an image, it converts it to a mask. Like uh, here in the image, it is like telling where the person are, and it uh, uh, converts from image to image conversion. Yeah, and uh, other than that, it also gives us the class uh, boundary boxes. Uh, the reason for uh, choosing this model is basically we are a based computing company and we have to run this model in a very constrained environment, which is resource deprived. Like we don't have that much of resources available in terms of computation. And also the environment that we had in the machine was very uh, given, like we can't modify much of the environment. Uh, there is uh, uh, some other models that are available in the, uh, in the research that are higher than this one, but uh, they, they required some higher computation. But for example, efficient debt is one of the highest rated model in terms of mass model, but that required TF2. At that time, it wasn't supported. So that's why uh, we used the Facebook implementation of the mass card scene, which is also pretty good. Like in terms of accuracy, in terms of precision, it is very close to this one, but efficient debt is a uh, sort of category in this one. Uh, and also, the Facebook Detecton is implemented in PyTorch. We use the Matterport implementation of the uh, uh, same model that was implemented in TensorFlow and Kera. Uh, so, so uh, I just listed some of the models uh, there in terms of uh, mass model. So, if you see uh, papers with code ranking for uh, semantic segmentation, efficient net, the deep lab version 3, these are some of the sort of paper and we have worked on them but somehow or another we face a uh, blocker and uh, we finally decided to go with this one that we have one based uh, a detector on model um, which was implemented in the PyTorch and uh, this one. One thing to mention here is that getting label data for this particular problem, problem is very costly and time consuming. Uh, because uh, from the labeler side, they have to label exactly the mask of, uh, uh, it's not a bounding box where you, uh, where you just uh, draw a simple, it has to be pixel by pixel accuracy that the person has to draw where the exactly the object is. Yeah, as Greg suggested, we have also taken help from some uh, uh, 3D uh, image generator, Terracosma. What they had, they had an uh, engine that can uh, give in a scenario, they can uh, generate white background images for us. And uh, yeah, labeling is also not needed for them because they have all the control environment. They can tell what object is there. Uh, that was a real helpful in this. Uh, now, why, why we wanted to use a mass model for this particular approach is uh, that I wanted to discuss. Uh, first, we could have simply gone with a object detection model, which uh, uh, detect like uh, the bounding fire is, is in the bounding box and we can tell the length of uh, uh, the fire. Problem is, let's say if this is the fire and we are saying this is the bounding box, of course, uh, uh, bounding box would be calculating the length of the fire as this one. While the model, the physics based model that we required, won't, uh, requ required as an input would be the curvature length of the fire that's going. This is a, uh, a simple case where the fire is relatively vertical, but there could be a case where the fire is bent like this. It's uh, nearly horizontal when the wind is blowing faster than the velocity the, the air is coming out so mass model is particularly helpful in that case that uh, we can when we have a mass we can 
travel around around, around the centroid of the mass and we can calculate exactly the uh, the the length of the curvature length of the fire and that could be helpful as an input uh, for our uh, further physics based model i will also show you like how much sensitive our model is based uh, for this fire length as greg mentioned it is particularly sensitive to pixel mapping but for the flare length also it is very sensitive like if it, if there is an error of 10% in the flare length it is a uh, factor of two times like it would be 20% error prone in the final output secondly uh, the 3d estimation that we do from a 2d figure is much more accurate than a bounding box uh, we have uh, uh, like one estimation model where, uh, which uh, converts this 2d mass to a 3d volume uh, sphere uh, uh, so for that the bounding box was not uh, uh, appropriate we use this mass to convert this uh, you can imagine this as this is a cone and we imagine it in a 3d uh, scenario where we revolve it around its axis like we uh, uh, rotate it around its axis now we imagine a cone around this and uh, we have a spherical volume calculated around this and we integrate 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 and we calculate the overall volume of the player that uh, that's there uh, it of course makes the assumption that the fire is circular at a particular projection, but according to our analysis, it was very fair to calculate, uh, assume because this is a controlled flow environment uh, where the fire is uh, designed to be in flow uh, flow manner. Yeah, so uh, this was the final result. The model that we developed uh, was based on the mass RCNN. Uh, we have also implemented or uh, trained some other efficient death model, D4, D6 model. Uh, they were resource intensive, of course. Uh, and the, the mobile net, which was a lighter one, uh, uh, and the required 224, 2x224 image, uh, uh, was cheapest uh, in terms of taking computation, but it was not very precise and uh, 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 accurate. The mask arching and model was, uh, as you can see, in some category in the player position, it was uh, greater than efficient that model. But in some of the categories, it was not that well. Like in the small position category, mass arching model uh, is, uh, uh, is not that good. Uh, efficient that D4 performs better than the mass arching model. Uh, one thing to note, note here is uh, that uh, the cameras which we are working is, is a very standard environment. It's not like uh, we are deploying in a wide variety of background. Uh, but the image that we taken out was taken some uh, some from internet, some from Paracosma, which was 3D generated with that wide variety of background. That's why these number could be uh, not that significant in terms of when we deploy it on site, the accuracy could be much higher than these reported numbers. But in a general scenario, this is the this is the reported accuracy from our model. As you can see, it's performing pretty well. We have uh, tested in a wide variety of background, and uh, it works pretty well in terms of accuracy and predicting where the fire is. Yeah, coming to the part two of the physics model. So what we have covered till now is uh, we have a video stream coming in. We feed it to the MRC in model. It gives us this player mask and smoke mask. Based on these smoke masks, we do a basic calculation of our uh, like we find what is the uh, conversion ratio, like how much one pixel is depicting in terms of feet and uh, uh, length term. And based on that, we calculate uh, these uh, uh, nine, 10 parameters that we have. And out of these parameters, one crucial parameter that I discussed is the fire length. Fire length, again, just to reiterate, the fire length is basically the length of the fire that is calculated from the stack tip. Uh, the center of the stack, the land of the stack, uh, the curvature land uh, uh, that's uh, going along the fire. So that's uh, taken as an input of this uh, 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 physics model and uh, wind speed prediction. So there is a empirical based evidence that's available uh, uh, in term, uh, like from uh, research. They have calculated this in a controlled environment that if uh, the behavior of the stack is very predictable in that like uh, how much of the fire length we would observe if we are giving this much of flow. These stacks are designed to be uh, behaving in a certain way and we can exploit that configuration uh, to uh, basically uh, predict how much of the volume we are running. Uh, these stacks uh, come in four kinds of configuration and we have basically uh, collected empirical evidence for all these four configurations. The HP here stands for high pressure stack, 
LT stands for low pressure, XT stands for high temperature, LT stands for low temperature. As someone mentioned the venturi uh, effect, uh, I think that is related to the high pressure condition. So in that case, the flow rate, if you observe, won't be that high. If the pressure is very high in the stack, then in that case, we don't, uh, the stack is designed in such a way that the fire land should not go above a certain threshold. Uh, that's a stack uh, configuration parameter. And the ask from the client is that uh, uh, fire should not go out of the frame uh, from the stack itself, uh, from the uh, sorry. Uh, so in uh, the venture effect, uh, so that uh, could be avoided in this case. The third part is the wind speed prediction model. Uh, the real time sensor that they had at the site was not particularly integratable with our system. Uh, but uh, given that our model, this physics based equation require the wind speed as a first input uh, as a crucial parameter because the bending of the fire is directly dependent on how much is the wind speed blowing. Uh, we required uh, this par particular parameter. So uh, we came up uh, with some analysis, uh, like the first analysis that we did is that uh, wind speed at the site was very cyclical. In that terms, it goes high at the particular time of the day and then it traveled down. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had only three months of data based on that we did this analysis. And uh, 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 what we also seen that the angle of the fire uh, is also correlated with the wind speed that uh, higher the wind speed, higher, uh, lower would be the angle from the horizontal. So we came up with a, a simple polynomial regression based model based on these two parameters that the wind speed is cyclical. It depends on the time of the day. And second thing it depends on, or uh, I would say it's a, a direct correlation with the angle of the fire. Uh, we feed these two parameters as an input to the polynomial regression model. Uh, and uh, yeah, we uh, also predict uh, wind speed uh, for, uh, from the KPI that we calculate. Uh, in terms of uh, like uh, effect of wind speed that we observed, so this is the normal prediction model, uh, like at, at the speed of uh, eight meter per second, uh, this would be the flow rate predicted. But if the wind speed is uh, lesser than that, that we, we have a 1% error or one meter per second error in the calculation, then the predicted flow rate would be uh, would be far away from actual one. Uh, what we have observed is if uh, uh, the flame length is very high, then the effect become uh, more uh, visible. Like in terms of error, the flow rate would be much higher, much higher or lower than the actual one. But when the flame length is lower, which is typically what we had at the site, which where we were working at the Vasset site. Uh, the flame length was or not higher than the 60 feet range as far we have observed. So uh, from our calculation, we have seen that uh, maximum uh, the error that uh, our wind speed prediction model was giving was 0 0.1 uh, million cubic feet per hour, uh, which is a reasonable estimate given uh, it's uh, 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 the client didn't had much accuracy expected from this project. Like they were had a limit of 25 to 30%. And this was in well under the limit of uh, four, 5% uh, error that is expected. And our wind speed prediction model was uh, uh, giving accuracy of uh, one meter per second. Uh, uh, like it had uh, plus minus one, plus, uh, one meter per second. While the range of the wind at the site was uh, plus uh, one to eight meter per second at during the time of the day. Uh, which is fairly like uh, from the feasibility of the project, it was uh, it was uh, good because otherwise we could would have uh, halted at the initial phase. Uh, as I discussed, that wind speed is a basic parameter that the physics based model uh, require as an input. Uh, that's why this was very crucial for us to either get it from the client or to do it by ourselves. So we choose the second way to predict it rather than stopping the project altogether. Yeah, and uh, these are some of the results uh, that we have observed. So as you can see, this is the flow rate, uh, flow meter. One thing to note here is the accuracy of this flow meter is per hour. Like it calculate only uh, in the last hour how much of the flow went through it. While our system is a real time, that's why you see more actions uh, or more up and down in the graph. The orange one is uh, predicted from what's happening uh, from uh, visual inferencing. One thing to observe here is that uh, uh, the flow meter is 
placed at the bottom of the stack while the visual inferencing is happening at the top of the stack. So there is some latency in the system in that sense, our system would be detecting a higher flow when the flow meter is detecting it before it is actually happening at the, uh, at the tip of the stack. Uh, yeah, and the accuracy which we have seen, the flow rate which uh, was given by the flow meter at that particular uh, in, uh, hour or instant was in the range of 20% uh, when the peak flow was happening. Uh, this one was the for the HP high pressure stack uh, uh, that we have observed. For the low pressure stack where the flow rate, if you see is uh, uh, in, in millions, uh, like I think 1.2 million uh, in low pressure stack, we had a higher volume in terms of flaring happening. Here also the accuracy and the trend that it was able to predict match quite well with what's happening actually on site. As you can see this peak, is actually happening in our slightly later than uh, expected. Yeah, this is again one other another LP stack that we uh, observed. And this was a uh, cyclical, and it was uh, able to predict quite well about uh, what's the trend of. Uh, flow going in and out. Uh, this is our real-time dashboard, which basically gives uh, uh, multiple parameters which are of importance to at, uh, at the site. Uh, and this works in multi-stack configuration, like one camera is deployed and we the client just need to tell where is the stack in the image. And we uh, basically calculate the output uh, flare, uh, flare, uh, flare volume for that particular stack. Uh, so, th so these parameters coming for the stack one, then these are for the stack two. These uh, are uh, KPIs related to that particular stacks. And these are the overall KPIs that we have uh, uh, computed addition, uh, in addition to all the stacks that we had. Yeah, these are some uh, appendix, I think. Uh, they, because these came, because we have observed this phenomenon like the stack parameter that are designed are uh, inertia dominated, which is the uh, venture effect, like the pressure is go uh, going above. This is not a uh, observed phenomenon at the site. Like the stack is typically at, that, at the site we had worked on uh, was not like this. The futures, uh, some of the future scope for this project was the predicting the gas composition, uh, because as you see, the gas density is a uh, input to the physics model that we were using, and it depends highly on what is the composition. So as of now, you have to give as an input what is the density of the gas that uh, the stack is <coughs> working with. But if we had the composition, or we can predict the composition from the flare color. Uh, and the smoke coming uh, smoke also then uh, we we will be able to predict uh, the density of the gas as well and the second would be integrate the real time wind sensor uh, to reduce the sensitivity of the model and then we could auto also auto detect the stacks for self configurability as of now the client has to in a ui has to input like there is a stack and uh, there is second stack we could also integrate this as our uh, model input uh, that uh, to uh, to be able to detect the stacks uh, uh, by itself. Uh, then there are some uh, boundary cases in which like uh, we have widely exposed images in which we have sun in the background or we have a, a light source which is uh, making the camera blurry or uh, we have wide exposed images uh, that could be gone through auto correction mode in our model uh, itself and then gone through uh, the model input. Uh, that's currently not there. Uh, this could be our additional scope for the project. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that's it. If we have any question, we can discuss. So any, any questions from the audience or anybody? So this is an example of one of about uh, five oil and gas enterprise solutions uh, that we've been working on. Uh, with uh, combining vision and sometimes with uh, physics models or really whatever is needed to get the job done. And we've rolled out at a number of different sites with these.
Uh, one of the questions on the chat SR had was he was asking about the um, the diameter of the pipe where it was being measured um, at the sensor of the flow meter versus the diameter of the pipe where it comes out at the tip. And if they're different, then they would have a different speed. And I, and I responded on chat, yes, there is a difference there, but they were already close. They weren't that far apart, but that would be a con contribution to part of the 10% error. Um, had, I would call that measurement error. So uh, description of the, uh, somebody, uh, Greg Weinstein asked, description of what the cloud resources were, the computer uh, necessary to train and operate the models. So the training system is one kind of model, one kind of hardware architecture, but the to um, operate the models for inferencing. So that would be like an Intel i7, um, uh, like a four core model. And so then we were running this on that uh, Intel i7, or I mean, it would be four physical cores, eight threads. And so we were running on that. Um, Amanchu, can you speak to what the frames per second was? Was it about one or two frames a second? Yeah, the, this mask arsenine model, we are running at uh, 10 frames per minute. Uh, uh, because we wanted to calculate uh, the real time uh, is for this project is very low. Because as of now, the, as I discussed, the flow meter reading uh, comes out per hour. Like it gives only one reading in one, one hour. So for this one, we ran it as low FPS. And the second thing is the machine on which we ran is a non-AVX machine. Uh, it's I think 10 year old system, which is very sluggish and they are running only one solution at it. Uh, and we didn't want it to burden it with the much more uh, uh, than it is required. It could the solution uh, if uh, given a full potential, it could run at one uh, five FPS also. Okay, okay. And then a, a question from Yash on the chat. Um, during extremely poor weather conditions, the image fidelity could be poor, I would assume like a sandstorm. The training set may not include a proportionate number of images skewing the distribution. How do you account for these? So I would say, I mean, that was part of the 3D image generation is that we could um, uh, try and uh, come up with different use cases and corner cases. And part of what we did do was like a windstorm where there was sand. So we did anticipate that to be something in the future we'd have to inference on. So we put it in the training set. We don't have to worry so much about the distribution. Like, is there 5% of the images a windstorm or 50% or images a windstorm? We don't have to worry at that level. Uh, we just have to have a sufficient volume or variety for the neural net to learn that corner use case. Um, Manchu, do you have any other comments to add for that question? Uh, yeah, we have used the Paracosma 3D label also, and we have a very robust uh, augmentation library and internal. So depending on the weather, we have widely observed ar around Aramco, white, what kind of weather condition we have. So for that, we use some augmentations, which are uh, uh, catered to the client uh, Aramco itself. Um, so they were asking, can you use the weather forecast for the fields? I don't believe a weather forecast was available at this remote location um, in the middle of the Middle East. But uh, do you happen to remember, Hamanchu? No, Greg. I, I don't think any sensor outside of our system was not used because it was uh, related to privacy and uh, concern. So no external sensors were included in this project. Yeah. Um, Carl was asking, is there a second camera to improve a 3D um, or for training? So that's one of the things we did think about. If we have two cameras perpendicular looking at the flame, and then you could be more independent of which way the wind is blowing. Like if the wind is blowing straight towards camera A, camera B would be good at picking up at it. And so that was something we had thought of and proposed to the client, um, but they just wanted to stick with the cost of a single camera solution, at least at this phase. Uh, you know, For future rollouts, it may be something that we could bring up again and integrate between the two cameras. Um, is there any video card being used to boost performance? Uh, no, there was no, like uh, you might consider an NVIDIA uh, GPU or other uh, video cards. For this particular solution, no. For some other uh, solutions in oil and gas, we are, uh, but not for this one. There's something in the QA. Uh, why does your client want to know the flow rate? How actionable are these flow rate results? So 
the client before this project, they would have somebody sitting in a trailer in the hot desert that may be 120 degrees outside looking to see if it's flaring or not. And so early on in the description of the project, um, as I was describing, they're doing a natural gas sweetening. They're, they've got this chemical engineering process where they're removing the sulfur. But unlike a manufacturing line where you can stop the manufacturing line, like if there's a robot broken, you can shut down the manufacturing line and stop putting on wheels at station one and start putting on hubcaps at station two. With it, when you're doing chemical engineering, you can't necessarily stop chemical reactions. And so <clears throat> what's actionable about this is they get the notice earlier and they get sent out by email or SMS text messages, which can be to a group of people. And so as soon as a flaring starts, they can get alerted and uh, to their messages. And then they can go investigate what is the problem in the, uh, of the chemical engineering process. So instead of having somebody who's sitting there watching, maybe on lunch break, get back a half hour later, then reports the flare, and they can report the flaring the minute it happens. The actional part is that they can go into the plant and see what needs to be changed. Because the other thing about this uh, uh, chemical engineering process is everything is in enclosed pipes, enclosed tanks. You can't see it as much. And so you just have to look at dials and knobs and instrumentation. You know, if you're looking at a manufacturing car floor, you can see is the factory running or are the car stopped? Um, and so it's much more of a uh, trying to detect a symptom of an upstream problem. Uh, back to where I was making the analogy, you know, if your car is burning black smoke, um, it's a symptom of, of uh, uh, you're burning oil. And so you need to do some adjustments in your engine uh, that you can't see inside the engine. So it's a similar kind of problem. It's like the first case where a symptom comes up. So that's one use case. The other use case is where flaring is um, happening, you know, how many hours of flaring are you getting per month or per year? And how can you reduce that? And so then if they can do some optimizations of their chemical engineering processing upstream to try and minimize the flaring, that's where the global warming impact improvement can be. So if they're trying some changes to their chemical engineering processes internally, and so if they're, they can go from, uh, say, uh, 40 hours of flaring one month down to 30 hours the next month and 25 hours the month after that, that gives them feedback on how their systems are improving and they're doing less flaring, they're doing less contribution to global warming at that site. So those are two types of, of uh, actionable things uh, from this. So that was a question from, from an anonymous attendee. But yes, a very good question. I see somebody had pasted in there, there was a link about another uh, wind forecasting system for um, fires, but that would depend on having other sensors and knowing that the terrain, the terrain in the desert was relatively flat and there weren't other sensors. There wasn't other historical prediction because it was very much remote out in the wilderness. Um, and so, so we wouldn't be able to use that system, but it would be good to look at uh, to see if we could kind of improve at other sites where there are more wind sensors. So what do, I do thank you for sharing that link. Okay. Well, if there's uh, no other questions, are there any other ACM announcements or anything else anybody else wants to add to close? Okay, well, we can go ahead and close the meeting. Thank you for attending. We appreciate your, your good questions and thoughts. Okay, thank you. I will end the meeting then. Thank you, Greg. Okay, thank you.